Okay, our very final presentation. I'm so glad you stuck it out. Y'all look very awake out there. I'm very impressed. Our last presentation is Navigating the Redesigned Judicial System Funding Schedules. Our last presenter is Barry Kelly. Barry began working for the Legislative Auditor in 2012 and currently works on special projects team in the Local Government Services section of LLA. He helps prepare state agreed upon procedures, updates, creates, and monitors the implementation of statutory required schedules, fulfills legislative requests, and provides assistance to local government officials and CPAs. Barry is a certified inter internal auditor and a member of the IIA. He graduated from the University of New Orleans with a bachelor's degree of science and accounting and a master's of business administration. Prior to working at the LLA, Barry worked as a sales tax auditor for the state of Louisiana. Please welcome Mr. Barry Kelly. All right, good afternoon and uh, welcome to your final presentation of the day. I'm sure you all are thrilled and ready to head on your way. Um, today we will be discussing the redesigned uh, judicial system funding schedules, also known as the Act 87 schedules. Um, during this presentation, I hope to kind of uh, explain to you guys the changes that we've made and why we've made those changes. And I will also attempt to kind of walk you through uh, how the new schedules look um, and explain to you guys how to access these schedules um, and how to give us feedback if you see any issues with the schedules. So first I want to discuss the legal requirement that is the entire reason for us having this schedule. Um, so Act 87 of the 2020 regular legislative session uh, put forth the requirement that the Legislative Auditor's Office and the Supreme, Louisiana Supreme Court uh, get together and develop a uniform reporting schedule for uh, pre and post adjudication court fines, fees, and uh, co costs. Um, and so we have done so, and there are certain requirements uh, that we have to implement in these schedules. And so the schedules that you guys are accustomed to uh, filling out, they have, these, they, they have these requirements in them. The things that are required are in those. And the, and the new redesigned schedule also contains those minimum requirements, which are uh, the pre- and post-adjudication court costs, fines, and fees assessed or imposed, the amounts collected, the amounts outstanding, the amounts retained, the amounts dispersed, and the amounts received from disbursements. So this is not a schedule that our office is imposing on you guys. This is something that the law requires of us to develop and it requires you guys to uh, complete and submit to our office. So we don't have any authority to postpone, suspend these schedules at all. Um, I wanna give a little background on, the, on, on these schedules. So they were first uh, required for entities with December 31st, 2020 year ends. And those schedules that we developed with the Supreme Court, uh, there were two schedules that were developed. So there was the collecting and dispersing schedule and the receiving schedule. The collecting and dispersing schedule was required to be completed for entities that uh, collect and disperse to other governmental entities and nonprofits pre and post adjudication court costs, fines, and fees. The receiving schedule is to be completed by those entities that receive uh, pre and post adjudication court costs, fines, and fees from a collecting and dispersing entity. And it may be difficult to see, but these are the uh, schedules that you guys have been using for the past several years. Um, they, they haven't really changed much since the initial implementation. Uh, there have been maybe a couple of changes to the titles on certain line items. Um, I know that most recently, which was about this time last year, we went through, we locked down that uh, column B, which, which is the one that contains all of your titles. And the reason we did that was because we found that uh, certain entities were, if, if they didn't have an amount to report on a certain line item, 
they would just delete that entire line item and instead of putting zeros. Um, there were also instances where people would add a collection type um, or a disbursement type that we didn't have listed. And so um, the whole idea is that we're able to collect data that is consistent and, and useful. And it's, um, it, it's more useful if we have uniform data that we receive. Um, and when you have you know, unexpected titles or things that are missing, it makes it difficult for us to analyze the data and put together uh, you know, any reports that we may have to put forth for the legislature as is requested. So those are the changes that we've made to these schedules um, that you guys are familiar with. Um, I do want to note that the schedules that you got, that I just showed you on the previous slide, may still be used um, until, if you, if you have a fiscal year that ends before December 31st, 2024, you may continue to use the schedules that you're accustomed to using that you just saw on the previous slide. However, the redesigned schedules that we're going to go over today must be utilized for those entities with fiscal years that end on December 31st, to, on or after December 31st, uh, 2024. So we expect that we'll start receiving these new schedules uh, around June of 2025. So we'll continue uh, with some background information. Uh, these things were in place with the, the current um, version of the schedules. So you guys are probably familiar with all of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll go over it again. And this is re th these things remain the case for the redesigned schedules. Uh, we do not require a blank schedule. So if you are an entity that does not collect or disperse, collect and disperse uh, funds to other entities, to other governments and nonprofits, you do not have to complete the collection and dispersing schedule. If you are an entity that does not receive any pre and post adjudication court costs, fines, and fees from another entity, you do not have to complete the receiving schedule. Basically, we do not want uh, schedules that contain zeros in the amount columns, right? So that, that continues to be the case. Also, um, as you guys are probably aware, there are two six-month columns on the schedules, um, and that was the case on the, the, the one that you're accustomed to and on the redesigned schedules. The reason we have those two six-month columns is because uh, we may do a reconciliation between the collecting and dispersing entities and those that receive uh, the funds. And there may be instances where there are different fiscal year ends, and so these six-month um, periods will enable us to compare, you know, those each six months, regardless of whether what the fiscal year end is for an entity. Um, and then the last little part it really only applies to courts. But if you are legally required to maintain and report separate funds for pre or post adjudication court costs, fines or fees, the receiving agency should prepare a separate receiving schedule for each fund, such as judicial expense fund or drug court fund. Now, um, the redesigned schedules, this is one of the first changes we'll go over. There, in the past, there were 12 collection types, and I'll, I'll just caveat it all with, uh, we say collection type on this slide, but a collection, throughout the presentation and in the schedules, the term collection type, disbursement type, remittance type, the categories are all the same, regardless of what, the, what they're called, um, but the categories are the same. So, but here we, we, we've called them collection types. So there were 12 um, and now there are 14. The reason we've added two additional categories is due to feedback we received from various people who have completed these um, schedules in the past. And we were informed that bond fees are a thing, but they are separate from cash bonds. Um, bond fees are a fee that is collected, I was told, uh, bond fees are a fee that's collected when there are commercial bonds, and cash bonds are a refundable deposit. So we, we've added the new category of cash bonds for that purpose. Um, you'll also notice that uh, number eight, criminal fines other, that is just a renaming. Um, in the past, there it was called criminal fines non-contempt. Um, and you'll see that the, one, the category uh, just prior to that is criminal fines contempt. 
We were told that that could be a little confusing for people when they're completing the schedule. So now you just have criminal fines, others. So you, and you essentially have criminal fines, contempt, and then the next category is all other criminal fines. And then you'll look down at number 11 and 12. Um, service fees and collection fees used to be one single line item, but we were told that there are differences between a service fee and a collection fee. And so we've now broken those two apart in their, their own um, their, their own category. So now we'll start going over the issues that we encountered with the schedules that we received previously. And these are the things that kind of prompted us to initiate our redesign of the schedules. Um, the, the main, we already kind of went over one of the issues we found, which as far as deleting roles and naming, renaming titles and adding categories and that kind of thing. The other issue we found was uh, inconsistent data entry, which also caused us issues when we go to try to look at the data that we have and do comparisons and analysis. So uh, one of the, 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 first, the first inconsistency that I want to discuss is the classification of disbursement type. Again, that's your collection type, disbursement type, remittance type. Um, so one entity, entity A, may classify an amount as a criminal fine other, while entity B may say it's a criminal court cost or fee. Um, and I have, I will say I, I'm, I'm not an attorney, and I, but I've looked at a lot of these laws, and it's not always clear exactly what it is. So the, I'm not surprised that there is that inconsistency from entity to entity, but it's important for us to have consistent data so that we are able to put together uh, reports for the legislature as requested. Um, so we had to come up with a way to try to make sure that everyone was calling uh, amounts collected and dispersed the same thing. And we'll go over that um, later on in this presentation. Uh, the second inconsistency that we noted was that there was inconsistent agency naming conventions being used by um, different entities. So Entity A may call the, the Department of Treasury Entity B may abbreviate department, and Entity C may call it the treasurer's office. Now, if you and I were having just conversation with one, each other, with one another on the phone or in person, and you called to any of those, I would understand exactly what you meant. Um, if you sent that to me in, in an email, I would understand exactly what you meant. But when we, we receive hundreds of these schedules, which means we have thousands of line items that we are uh, try, attempting to analyze and summarize and, and, and do comparisons. So it's important that we have, we call that entity the same thing at every entity. So we've put forth some changes that we hope will address that issue as well. So the first change is probably going to be the least popular change. Um, and that is that we are going to require that for every dollar that is dispersed by a collector to a another government or to a nonprofit, the law will have to be cited that enables you to collect and disperse that money. Um, and the reason that we have implemented that is because we have gone through and tried to identify as many laws as we can, and we've put them into a master list, and we have assigned to each of those laws a um, collection type. Right. So if you regardless of what entity you are, if you select that law as the enabling law, you will be limited to the collection type that we've assigned it. And the hope is that. Will everyone that collects money under a particular law will call it the same thing and we'll be able to have better data to present to the legislature if so requested. Um, and along those same lines. For every law that's in our master list, we have assigned a we have assigned collectors that are associated with that law, and we have assigned receivers or entities that can receive that money from a collector. And the idea there is, is that we don't want a clerk of court, for example, to go in there and just see a thousand laws, you know, 70% of which may not have anything to do with their function as a clerk of court. We wanted to limit the laws that are available to your entity to the laws that actually are applicable to your entity. And then on the other end, when you're completing the schedule, 
we don't want you to go in, we want you, the, when you select the entity that is uh, receiving the money, we wanted you to be able to limit those to what the law actually says, um, what type of entity the law says can receive the money. Um, a good example would be if a law says that a sheriff is the one that collects the money and that money can be dispersed to the parish government, the idea is that a sheriff would, when they're inputting this data, they would only see the laws that are applicable to them as far as them being the collector. And then when they select the law, only the parish governments would be available um, as, as a receiver of that money instead of them having to look through thousands of different entities. And this is just showing you, this is, this is the data entry form on the, the collecting and dispersing schedule. And this is where you will, what you will use to input the laws, the agency names, the amount, dollar amounts, and the collection types. Um, but I just wanted to show you, we're going to go over it in more detail later on in the presentation. But I just wanted to show you guys that if you look at the disbursement type where that drop down menu is, for this law, there's only one disbursement type um, displayed there. So you would have to pick criminal fines contempt. So anybody who is, is using CCRP 25 as their legal authorization for collecting and dispersing that money would have to pick criminal fines contempt. And, um, the, and the hope is that that really helps us be able to do the analysis and comparison that we need to do. The second change is to address the inconsistency in the naming conventions of agencies. Now this one is gonna be less of a burden on you guys, um, but I'll give you a little bit of the background on how we, how we did this. So within our office, we have a system called Tracker, and every entity that submits reports to our office is in that system. Um, and they are, are assigned an entity ID, which is a four or five digit uh, number that we use to identify agencies. Um, I've been at this office about 12 years, so I believe it was right after I started working here, there was a project that, was, uh, that, that they had that, that was performed um, where we went through and we took the different names of entities. The, the names were kind of all over the place. It was kind of whatever people told us their name was, it was the name that was in Tracker at the time. But the project that, that was uh, performed was to kind of change the naming conventions to make the naming convention for every particular entity the same. So what I mean by that is, uh, if you look here, the public defender. So you see there's the 10th Judicial District Public Defender, the 11th and 42nd Judicial District Public Defender, 12th Judicial District Public Defender, and so on. Um, in practice, someone could submit a schedule to us, and they may just say 18, uh, the East Baton Rouge Parish Public Defender instead of the, the 19th uh, JDC Public Defender. And so what we've done is, is we required that you use the name that we have in Tracker, basically, is the name that you're going to be using when you complete the schedules going forward. Um, and you, you, will, you probably will not know exactly what we call it in our system, so we do have search functions uh, that we've created to help you identify the name that we use in our system. And here is just another example. Again, this is just a data entry form that you will use to input this data, but I just wanted to show you guys uh, the drop-down menu that shows you, uh, you know, how the names are all similar. So these are parish governments here that are, that are contained in this drop-down menu. And as you can see, it's the Acadia Parish Police Jury, Allen Parish Police Jury, et cetera, et cetera. So changes to the schedules the, the, that, that don't have so much to do with the content. These are more so tools that we have implemented uh, in, the, in the schedules to help you guys both adapt to the changes that we have uh, instituted and also to um, just help you guys when you complete the, the uh, schedules from having to enter so much information manually. Now you have drop down menus, you have search options, and there are error checks. So I've received phone calls with the current um, uh, schedule and someone will call and say, look, it's not working. I don't know why I'm trying to enter the information uh, the way that you guys have in instructed us to, but for some reason, it's not taking it. I don't know what's going on. And, at the, and, and currently, you know, I'll have to pull up a blank schedule and kind of try to uh, reenact re what they're doing to see if I get the same error. Well, now we have a series of error, mess, uh, error, error boxes 
that will inform the user of potential errors that they may encounter. For example, uh, you may have an instance where you have uh, dispersed more than you've collected, or maybe you have put um, alphabets in, in, a, in a box that requires you to put numerical uh, digits. So things like that will show up in these error, error boxes, and, the, and, and hopefully it will um, you know, cut down on confusion on your part, and um, it'll make it easier for you to solve the, the problems. Um, you'll also see down there at the bottom, my contact information is there. You may not be able to read it, I don't know, but uh, it's gonna be throughout the schedules that you guys use. My name and my telephone number and my email address are all throughout the schedules. I want you to feel free to contact me with questions, suggestions, criticism, and if you are so inclined, praise <laughs> uh, <laughs> for these schedules. Um, but yeah, don't, seriously, do not hesitate to contact me with any, any issues you may encounter. Um, again, my, my information is throughout the schedules. So now I wanna walk you guys through the schedule, um, the redesign schedule. Um, it's not perfect because it's on PDF, um, on, well, on a PowerPoint, so they're just screenshots of the actual schedule. But I think it'll give you guys some idea of what it is that you guys are gonna be looking at when you go to complete this, this schedule. Um, I do want to tell you that we do have an actual instructional video on our website um, in the same location that these procedure, these uh, schedules are located. So, and, and in that that video actually, you know, will walk you through the entire process, and it'll be a little bit more clearer uh, because it's a video. Um, the video is only about 15 minutes long, so and I recommend everybody, you know, take a look at it. Even though the schedules aren't required for you, you know, for you to submit right now. I, I would suggest everyone get familiar with the schedules and just take a look at that video um, and even play around with the schedules themselves and see if you encounter any issues because I personally would rather you uh, discover any potential errors on our part or any issues that you see or anything that you think may make it more user friendly. I'd rather you find it now and, and pass that information along to us so that we can make any uh, alterations to the schedules before they're actually required. Uh, their use is actually required. So the first, when you open the, let me, let me take a step back. So the, you guys are accustomed to two different Excel uh, files. The, currently the, the collection and dispersing uh, schedule is in one Excel file and the receiving schedule is in a separate uh, Excel file. For the redesign schedules, we have basically combined those two schedules into one Excel file. So when you open that, that Excel uh, file, this is the first um, page you will see on your screen. This is a, the, the first tab. You will need to click Enable Content, um, enable to see all of the, uh, to run the macros and for you to be able to see all of the information you need when you complete the schedules. So once you click Enable Content, the Agency Information tab will appear for you. Um, and so that's the route we've taken with this uh, redesign schedule, is that the collecting and dispersing schedule tab will be, well, the, the collecting and dispersing schedule will be its own tab within this file. The receiving schedule will be its own tab within this file. So they're no longer two separate uh, Excel files. Um, so the agency information tab is where you will enter your, your agency's information, right? So um, if you look at the red numbers, the, the red numbers you see on there are not actually in the schedule. Um, I've added those for uh, the PowerPoint's uh, purposes just to kind of draw yourself, your attention to different areas on the schedule. And on the right side of the screen, you will see a description that uh, aligns with the numbers, the red numbers that you see on the screen. Um, so when you open, this, when, when, when you go to this First page, um, this is all you will have available to you. No other tabs will be available to you. Uh, we need you to put your agency's information in on this uh, tab. The first thing you will put is your entity's uh, agency ID number. You may or may not know that. That is the number that is assigned by our office to your um, agency you know, that we use internally. Um, if you know it, great. You can type it in right there manually and it will automatically populate the second row that you see, which is your agency name. Um, if you do not know your entity ID, 
that is not a problem. Uh, we have created the agency uh, search button that you see at the top in, I guess that's magenta or purple or pink. I'm not sure what it is, but that, that little color at the top, that button, you click on it and it will take you to this. And you can use this to locate your entity's uh, name and entity ID number. Um, and there are a number, of way, a number of ways that you can use this search feature. You can type in, so you'll see here we have, we created a fictional uh, municipality called the City of Nowhere. And um, so if you go in that top cell, top field, you, type, you can type in whatever you want to type when you search for your entity. So here we, we've typed Nowhere. And if you click uh, where you see number five, uh, which is click here to search, you'll see a list of uh, search results at the bottom of your screen in the agency search results. The top search result is going to be the um, most relevant. That's, the, that's the, the intent is for that top search result to be uh, the most relevant to your search. Um, you can also utilize the other fields such as the um, agency parish and agency type. Let's say you did not want to include any inner any information in that in, in section number one there. You could go to the agency parish. It's a drop down uh, menu and you can select your parish and all of the entities that report to our office uh, in that parish will appear for you in the search results. Uh, once you, you, you click on uh, the, the parish and you'd have to click uh, click here to search, but then all of the entities located in that parish will appear in the search results. Um, same thing for agency type. Let's just say you picked municipality as your um, agency type and you hit click here to search. Every municipality that reports to us would appear in your search, search results. You can also do a combination of um, using the different sections when you do your search. So I know I, when in testing the, the, the schedule, I have um, done it myself where I've put in, in, in section number one, I've typed in sheriff. And then in uh, section two, where the agencies parish, I'll pick a parish just to say Wynn Parish. And once you hit click here to search, in your results, you will see the Wynn Parish Sheriff. And you can select that and your entity ID number is there. Um, and once you select it, you hit save data, which is number six on your screen. And we'll go back. And that will automatically populate your entity ID and your agency ID once you select those. Um, you do have the ability to change the agency name um, on row two there where you see the number three. And the reason we've enabled uh, you guys to make changes to the agency name, to your agency's name, is because we want you to be able to match your agency's name in this schedule to whatever is on your um, annual report. Sometimes I know it's written a little bit differently. So you have that ability to change your agency's name. Um, right there at number four, you'll see that there is, um, that, that's where you will enter your, the, the fiscal period for which you're entering the information. Um, and it's important that you, you, know, you put that in there because that information will be used to auto-populate the two, two six-month rows. Those dates will be auto-populate on the schedules based on what you input here. Um, and then the, in, the, in the orange color at number five, that question is, did your entity uh, collect and disperse any funds during the year? Um, the funds that we're talking about, the money that we're talking about there is the pre and post adjudication uh, costs, fines, and fees. Um, you need to answer that either yes or no. If you uh, say yes, you will receive a, a new tab will appear. The collecting and dispersing tab will appear for you. If you say no, it will not appear. Same thing applies to the question that's down there in uh, light blue or gray, uh, which is, did your entity receive any money during the period? If you answer yes, you will receive the uh, re access to the receiving tab. If you answer no, you will not. So it'll be the same document, but you'll say yes and yes. You'll answer yes to both questions and you'll have two tabs appear within the same document. You'll have the collecting and dispersing schedule and the receiving schedule. Um, if, if you receive money, if a sheriff's office is receiving money from another entity. Um, uh, 
No, that's, that's not what we mean by receiving. So you're receiving, the money you receive would have to be from a different entity. Um, if it's that we, there's a section in the actual uh, collecting and dispersing schedule as far as money that you've retained um, at your entity. It, yeah, that'll be, that'll be within the, that one. But no, the receiving schedule would need to be completed if you received money from, I don't know, you know, the parish government or some outside entity. Um, and so just a couple other things on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on this slide. Uh, number seven is the error checks. Again, if there's something that you put in there that is not uh, correct, let's say in the entity ID number you put ABC instead, it'll tell you, hey, you cannot put alphabet in here, you need to put a number. Um, same thing with the date. If you put a date that's too far in the future or too far in the past, you will not be able, it'll, it'll tell you, hey, this, this is not a, um, a, a date that we can use. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see in, uh, a, the, a summary of errors on all of the other tabs. So, so if you have any issues, any errors on the collection and dispersing tab, that'll be summarized here. Same for receiving uh, the receiving schedule. And you'll see that there is a five disbursement detail uh, tab. And we'll go over what that is um, in a few slides. But if there was an error there, that would appear there as well. The idea is that once you finish completing the schedules, there will be zero errors in that um, summary. So this is what the collecting and dispersing schedule looks like since we've redesigned it. It looks very similar to what you guys are accustomed to. Um, not many changes have been made. Um, I know you can't really read the text here, and that's really not important because it's very similar to what you guys have already seen. Um, but you know, take a look at it. There have been a couple of changes to some of the titles, but it's essentially the same. But there are a few things that I want to draw your attention to. So number one, um, at number one at the top in red, is the agency uh, name. That will auto-populate based on the information that you put on the agency information tab. You will not need to manually enter the name on the schedules. They will auto-populate based on the information you put on that first tab. Um, the same, same goes for the two columns. Those dates will auto-populate based on the dates you input on the agency information tab. Um, the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is it's very small, but the five disbursement detail line. Um, it's one line item. You, you guys on the, on the, on the um, older version, you, know, you guys had to go in and manually type in the name of the entity you disperse money to, along with what type of disbursement was being made. Um, and you'll see here, there is no spot for you to do that. Um, and that is because we have created a separate tab where you will enter that information, and that is that five disbursement detail tab. Um, but you will not get access to that tab until you have entered an amount in all of these white cells in those two columns. Um, there are uh, some of those cells, the darker, tab, the darker cells and the gray uh, cells that you see, those have um, formulas in them and they will auto you know, calculate the sums and everything for you after you inf enter information in those white cells. But once you have put information in all of those white cells, and if there are no errors over there in that column all the way to the right, you will gain access to the five disbursement detail tab, which is this. And so I've only done a little screenshot of just one line item that has been entered onto this detail tab. Um, but you can see that it includes uh, 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 the receiving agency, which in this case is Nowhere City Court. Uh, you'll see that it has a, descri a description of the disbursement, the legal authority, which is you know, the law that authorized the collection and disbursement of the money, the disbursement type, in this case is criminal fines, contempt, and then the amount for each of the six months. Um, this is just one line item. Now, once you have gone and entered all of your disbursements that your entity has made, uh, the sum of those disbursements will appear on line five, uh, which is, I believe, is the, the red number eight on here. It will appear there. The sum of it will appear there on that schedule. Um, but you do not have to manually type all of these, this information for each line item. Um, that data entry form button at the top can be utilized to enter all of your information. So there you will see um, 
all of the relevant information has its own field. Um, and so the, the idea is that you will select the applicable law that has authorized you to collect and disperse the funds. Um, here you'll see is CCRP 25. Now, if you went to this, if all of this was blank, you could click on that drop down menu and only those laws that we have assigned to your entity as a collector will appear for your entity. Um, you can select from that drop down menu. Some of you may have very few that are assigned to your entity, while others of you may have hundreds of laws that are assigned to your, your entity. Um, and so what we've done is we've created the authority search button that you see there in yellow at number, uh, red number seven. And you can use it to search for the applicable law uh, for, your, for each disbursement. Um, there you'll see you can type in a disbursement description at the top. Here you'll see I typed in contempt. I've typed in contempt and I've hit click here to search. And down there in your search results, you'll see all the laws that we have in our database that contain the word contempt. Um, and you can select from those laws, um, those that are applicable to you guys. Um, you'll also see that you can search by agency receiving money. So all of the, so if you go, if you, if you go to that um, drop down menu, you can select an entity um, any entity that we have, we have said can receive money from your particular entity will appear there and you can collect, select uh, from that drop down menu. Um, and you can also um, filter by disbursement type for the laws that we have assigned to your entity. Um, the buttons on the side will just, they're, they're kind of the same for all of the data entry forms, but you can hit save data. And when you hit save data, the information that you input will appear on um, whatever schedule you're working on or that information tab. Um, if you hit reset search, everything will clear out. All of the, everything will go back to its default blank um, status. And if you hit close form, it'll just close out these little data, data entry forms. So that tool is there for you to help you uh, locate the laws that you need when you complete the collecting and dispersing schedule. Um, We'll go back to the data entry form for the collecting and dispersing schedule, and you'll see that you have to input the agency that's receiving money. Um, there is an agency search feature there as well. I didn't include another uh, slide because it's the same as the one we went over uh, earlier in the presentation, but you can use that to locate the entities that receive money um, from you, and that'll help you, you know, use the name that we use when we, we, um, in our, in our system so that we'll have the consistent naming convention. Um, I believe I mentioned it before, but when you, for each law we have assigned the collection or dispersing type. So for this, inst this, this particular law, the only uh, disbursement type that you will see is that criminal fines contempt. And that's what you will have to use. You don't have to manually type it. Once you select that law, that field will auto-populate. And so all you would have to do at this point, once you have selected your agency that's receiving money and you've selected the law, you would enter the amount for each six month period and you'd hit save data. And if there are no errors down there in that big box, that data that you input would appear as a line item on your disbursement detail schedule. And after you've done that for each disbursement, uh, that sum will appear as the, the five disbursement uh, detail the, the five disbursements to other uh, governments and nonprofits line down there at number eight. So now to the receiving schedule. Um, this is a lot easier. So if all you do is receive funds, you do not have to cite the law for uh, the money that you receive. All you will need to do is select the entity that remitted the money to you and the type of funds that were remitted to you. Um, and, and so and that's literally it. Um, it's very similar to what you guys have already been doing on the receiving schedule side. The only difference is, is that you have to use the names and the names of the entities that we uh, use in our internally. So you, you would need, so if you look at this data entry form for the receiving schedule, there's that agency search button again you can utilize it to um, locate the name that we use in our system 
Um, and, and that's basically it. And you would enter that information here, hit save, and it will auto-populate the lines, the rows at the bottom, that bottom portion of the schedule. Now, you will have to manually enter that top part, um, which is red number four, um, which is the ending balance of accounts assessed but not received. You will manually enter those amounts, and you will have to enter an amount. It will either be zero or some positive number um, there. And uh, I did want to mention earlier that the good news is, is that you only have to cite the law for those uh, entities you're dispersing money to. If you collect money and you retain that money, you don't have to, to cite the law. If you collect money um, and you are reimbursing an individual or you're sending money to some other third party contractor or anything like that, you do not have to cite the law for those disbursements. You're only citing the law for those disbursements that are made to other governments and nonprofits. Um, and then, the, you know, the good news is if you're doing only a receiving schedule, you don't have to cite the law at all um, on, on that schedule. Um, hopefully you guys never see this, but I wanted to just uh, go over it just briefly in case you guys do see it, um, and I don't want you to panic. So if you see this, that means that something is wrong in the background. Uh, it's nothing that you've done incorrectly, but there is some kind of issue in the coding or there's a formula that's, that's incorrect, um, something along those lines. And so what I ask you to do if you do see this is either take a screenshot of this and email it to me or just simply email me um, the code name that, that's listed there, the error number, and the error description. Now, I don't have the technical expertise to go in and make any corrections to the coding or anything, but my colleague, Stephen Kramer, is very good at all of this, and he is the guy that I would for forward your uh, concern to, and I promise you that we'll get it all fixed and um, corrected so that you guys can utilize the um, schedules as designed. And this is just a very simple thing. I don't want you guys closing out of your schedules after you've entered a ton of information. There's nothing worse than doing a bunch of work and then losing it all and having to redo it. So if you hit X at the top of your schedule, this box will appear. Um, if you click save, it will save all the data that you've entered and it will close out the schedule. If you click don't save, it will still close out the schedule, but none of the information you entered will be saved. And if you hit cancel, that'll just close this box that pops up. Uh, we added this because we did not want you to hit X and then lose everything. We wanted to make sure that you really wanted to exit this document uh, before, uh, before you actually did, because we don't want you to lose any of that work. So this is the link to the area of our website where all of this information is located. Um, at this link, you will find the actual schedules themselves, as well as written instructions and the instructional video that I uh, mentioned earlier, as well as FAQs. Um, all of that can be found there. And so I encourage you guys to definitely go check it out. Um, and this is just a screenshot of that page because I do want to make you aware that the, the schedules that you guys are accustomed to using are still there uh, because you are allowed to use those for fiscal years that end before December 31st, uh, 2024. So they're still up, but they're towards the bottom of the page. So at the top, the top section, um, that's the redesign schedules that must be used for entities with fiscal years ending on, on or after December 31st, 2024. That bottom section uh, are the schedules that can be used for those entities that have uh, fiscal years ending before December 31st, 2024. Um, and we do have that little text there that that make sure that you're aware of which schedule you're using. And this is one more feature that we have um, designed um, and to enable you guys to give us feedback. We've put a lot of work into going through, trying to identify all of these laws and assign the disbursement type and the collectors and receivers, and it's been a lot of work, and we've worked really hard and done a, 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 a we, we, we hope we've done a good job doing so. However, you guys are the ones who work in the field every day with these laws, with this money, and you guys are the experts. 
Um, so if while completing these schedules, you guys uh, determine that maybe we're missing a law or we have uh, categorized a collection type incorrectly or there is a law that you guys feel your entity should have available to you either as a collector or a receiver, uh, we want you to access this request form and send it to us. Tell us what law it is. Tell, what, tell us what issues you think need to be resolved, what changes need to be made. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you can't see it, but at the bottom of this screen, uh, there is an area where you'll put in your contact information. Uh, once you hit submit, it goes into a database. I receive an email that someone has requested a change, and um, you know we'll look into it to see if it is something that we we actually need to change. I may reach back out to you guys to get you know further feedback. Um, and all of this, 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 the link to this request form is in is in that same location as these schedules. So um, please, please do not hesitate to send us any uh, suggestions for any any corrections you guys think we need to make. And with that, I'm uh, I'm finished. I'll be here if you guys have any questions. Um, and I think Diane's going to come up for some closing remarks. Thank you guys, and uh, please reach out to me if you have any issues. we go. Easy as that. Thank you for your attention. For those of you who may not be returning tomorrow, just things to note, we will get your CPE certificates tomorrow. Um, we will get your CPE certificates to you. Won't be tomorrow. Give us till about mid-April. It's still a manual process. I need to work on that, right, and fix that. And um, we also will be sending out a survey. We really, really want you to fill out the survey because we use the survey to design the next program. And so we really value your input for that. So tomorrow we get to start at 8.30. There will be more muffins, so don't stress. We will have muffins for you, lots of coffee, right? And we're going to learn about federal procurement. So thank you so much. Have a very good evening. <laughs>